This story was written by Scott Horsley of National Public Radio, and he says, For all the upheaval of recent years, one thing has stayed the same. Liam and Olivia are still the most popular baby names in the U.S. for a fifth year in the row. So I guess, Lapines, you can... Uh, you're, you're, you're trendsetters there. <laughs> An annual tally by the Social Security Administration released just in time, uh, this story was written at Mother's Day, shows that 20,802 baby boys were named Liam last year, while 15,270 baby girls were named Olivia. Also, for the fifth year running, Noah and Emma were the runners-up. So we have a trendsetter in our family, too. Almost all the popular names, the most popular names, have remained remarkably similar and consistent from year to year. Mateo was the only new entry to crack the top ten list for either boys or girls' names in 23. While some names gained newfound buzz last year, Isaiah and Chosen for boys, and Kaylee with a unorthodox spelling, K-A-E-L-I, and a Litzel for girls, they remain behind the trusted standbys like Oliver and Charlotte. Well, Dr. Clay, there's one for you. More than one out of 100 baby boys was named Liam last year, while Olivia was attached to just under one in 100 baby girls. Everyone thinks they're choosing a name that's just so special for their child, University of Chicago professor Eric Oliver told Freakonomics Radio back in 2013. It's only when they get to the playground and there are half a dozen other Ellas that they realize, oh, maybe I'm part of a social trend. <laughs> and Ella was the 13th most popular girl's name in 2013. By last year, it had dropped to 32nd place. Pop cultural influence may give a lift to some previously obscure names. Social Security researchers note that Chosen, the second fastest growing boy's name, is a character on the Netflix show Cobra Kai. The rise of Kaylee as a girl's name may have been sparked by TikTok star Kaylee McEwen, which probably goes off over most of your heads there. I, I have no idea. TikTok is something I have not gotten into, but maybe our teenagers could tell us a little bit about who she is. I have no idea. But what I do know is when we choose names for our children, there's different reasons. Sometimes maybe it's what's popular, what, what sounds good. I read this name in a book, or it's like they say here, maybe it was a character on a show or something, and I just like the sound of it. Other times we might have different purposes, like my son, my son Reggie, my, my oldest son, I have three now, but I get to pick his name, and I had picked his name for his oldest sister, his second sister, and his third sister before I finally got to use it uh, four years down. Reginald is, you know, it, it's, it's a, it sounds like he should be an athlete or something, but, you know, he, he's going to be a star running back or defensive end for the Packers or, or, or something like this. But it has nothing to do with that because I am definitely not a Packers fan, Bill. <laughs> uh, but, but Reginald was my paternal grandfather's name. He was Reginald Francis Linscott, but we couldn't quite bring ourselves to call him Reginald Francis. It just sounded too feminine. Uh, and so we have Reginald named after my grandfather, and his middle name is Conrad, which was my mother-in-law's maiden name. And so we have two different sides of the family represented, and, and it gives us maybe a, a connection to their heritage. Reginald, my grandfather, was a man who loved the Lord. He was a faithful church member, uh, taught Sunday school, gave me some of my spiritual heritage. Conrad, maybe that's where Reggie gets some of his musical note, uh, was my wife's grandfather. He was, for many years, a member at Wealthy Street Baptist Church in Grand Rapids, which is a GRBC church, and was the, the orchestra leader for many of those years, even as he also served as a member of the Grand Rapids Police Department. Uh, and so maybe that's where some of Reggie's connections and his musical skills and abilities come with that. My grandfather, on the other hand, he was not a singer. He used to, the best he could do is he'd carry around a radio in a bucket so he could say he could carry a tune in a bucket. Uh, that was about, about the size of it there. But we still had that connection, that family history. When we named our girls, 
we had the opportunity to think through some biblical significance. And so we had Abigail. Catriel is not a biblical name, but we, we went through a, a name dictionary. We were looking for inspiration. We liked Katie, but we actually came across Catriel, which is my second daughter's name. It was a Hebrew boy's name, but it meant the Lord is my crown. We said, that sounds kind of cool. Nobody else is going to have Catriel. And of course, whenever she goes out, you know, they always horribly mispronounce. Okay, is there a Catriel here in the waiting room? Yeah, that, that always gets out there. But that, that still has some significance for us. We wanted to dedicate her to the Lord. Dory, who just gave her testimony, is our third daughter, and her name means gift of God. Uh, and I actually was rooting for Theodora more than Dorothea, but we compromised. Actually, if, if I'd won out, I really wanted Beatrix, but my wife couldn't see that, and I said, we could call her Trixie. And no, that, that wasn't going. So we, I wanted to call her Gertrude, too, which was after my grandmother. And she's, no, Gertrude is definitely not there. I was like, we could have had Gertie. You could have been Gertie. <laughs> Again, I got voted down. So Dory, I think Dory works. But and even with our adopted children, we had names that we inherited. But we were able to help think through some of those things. And so as they took on our family name. There was meaning there. There was significance there, but we were also able to expand them out. They came to us with legal names, and as we changed their names, we preserved Emma. We, we, Emma came to us as Emma, and we expanded her name out to Amelia, but we gave her the middle name of Ruth as somebody who was from a different place and came in to the nation of Israel. So was Emma coming from a different family and becoming part of our family, and she added the name Lynn Scott, which she carries with us. She has our stamp on her life. Caleb came in actually with the same phonetic name, but he had the letter K originally to start off Caleb, and we changed it to a C to match uh, the man in the Bible who had faith, but we also gave him the name Judson as a middle name after the American missionary hero who pioneered the gospel in Burma. And then we had Hayden, also known as Hayden the Maiden. <laughs> but that, that's our family thing. But Hayden came in with Joshua. We thought Joshua pairs up well with Caleb, and Joshua was a leader, and Joshua was a man of faith. And as they added their names in, each one had meaning. Each one had significance. And maybe you, if I were to talk to some of you, you would have similar stories after some family connection, somebody who was inspiring to you. Maybe it was just somebody who was really cool. It, it, it just sounded name and you liked the sound of it. But as you've explored the meeting, it adds significance. It has certainly meaning to you, meaning to the people who love you. And sometimes we have different names like that that connect to maybe not legally or formally but we have the names that bring a smile to our face like Hayden and the Maiden or <laughs> the different ways that we have pet names family names significant names maybe we've earned by reputation or it, it symbolizes the relationship sometimes we have different titles that show respect or fondness sometimes you earn names because of work that you've done and the respect that that brings some of you we can in this room we can call doctor and that shows what both of you have learned but the care and concern that you have for others some people here in this room are called things like dad and mom some of you even get that title or grandma without necessarily having brought those people physically into the world but because of the relationship that you've shared and the significance that you have developed. As we look to the text this morning, God tells us the story of someone who was also given a name. We're going to look at the name that that one gave the other, even as we also compare that to the name that God gave them. So let's look at our text, our Genesis chapter 3, and verse 20, and as it says, which is interesting in the timing, you think of all this, God has just given Adam and Eve the sentence, the curses that we looked at last week, 
And then, right after God says, you are dust, and to dust you shall return at the end of verse 19, it seems like it's an oddly placed point to put this verse. Verse 20, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And even as we look to God's word here and we see Christ, how does this verse help us to see Christ? How do we meet Christ through Adam calling his wife Eve? That's what I hope to, us to help us think through this morning. As we look at the first point on that outline on the back of your worship guide, you should be having the first point is that God supplies identity. He gives us our identity even as he helped Adam and Eve with their identity. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Up to this point, we've referred to Adam and Eve, but we've done so in anticipation. She has, to this point, only been called the woman. That's how they've been referred to. Adam is literally the translation of the Hebrew word for all of humanity, for mankind or man. Adam is the one who, the human being who was formed out of the ground. He was the first human being. And it's an interesting thing when you look at the names that God gave them. It doesn't really tell us here in Genesis chapter 3, but it does give us a hint of what God called and how God referred to both of them in Genesis chapter 5, if you turn over a page or two. And as it says in verses 1 and 2, this is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him, Adam, in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and named them, the ESV says, man, when they were created. So together, that was the name that he gave them in partnership. And that's that first point uh, under God supplies identity. The sub point is that God gives us definition. He gives us identity in partnership with others. That's how God recognizes humanity as needing both the male and the female component. I don't think it's an overstatement to say that the default position for human existence is a man and a woman living together as husband and wife and having children. That doesn't mean that it's an explicit command that if you are somehow a lifelong single person that you are running out of character or you're living a life that's disobedient to what God has laid out. It's not explicitly a command that every one of us needs to fulfill, but it is the default position of human existence. This is the normal, typical behavior that is expected, the way that God created us to live and to function in society. Whether or not you have a spouse, whether or not you are a parent, it is something that society needs, that relationship to grow, develop, and flourish in order for us to have human civilization, in order for us to have all the things that we have. Now, can there be exceptions? Can there be single people? Yes, obviously we know that. Can there be people who are conceived outside of the normal expectation? Yes, we know that. And we have people here in this congregation who have come to be because of exceptions to the rule. But the exceptions don't disprove the rule or cause us to discard it. They often show us the value of keeping the way things that God intended. That you, maybe as a single person, can be a blessing and a help. Or you've experienced God's blessing and provision because of your own parents or the way that you've been able to minister to families or to children. Maybe sometimes who are deprived of some of those figures, like some of you who can be called grandma, but they're away from family, they're away from people, and you can fill that role in decisive and meaningful ways. Maybe you're a family like ours that has been able to take children whose parents couldn't care for them and bring them and give them hope 
and fulfillment and share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Friends, these things are there because that's the way that God created it. That's the way that God intended it to be. That institution is his gift to society. And when it functions and flourishes, we know God's favor. We know God's blessing. Whether you're involved in that relationship personally or not, it's something that we should value. It's something that we should respect. It's something that, frankly, more Christians need to do a better job at prioritizing when they teach their children. This is not just something you want to prepare yourself for, for a career you find fulfillment. There is fulfillment. There is blessing. There is satisfaction that comes out of a life lived for God with another person with whom you share a meaningful, profound, promise relationship with. All too often when we look out at the world, and we see the destruction, the despair, the conflict in a marriage. And even, let's, let's just be, be, be straight and frank here, even the most godly of marriages will experience occasional strife and discord because we are all flawed, sinful human beings. We are all people who are bearing the curse of sin in the verses that just precede this. There is going to be conflict. God foretold that there is going to be conflict. Some of you have experienced that, maybe in your marriages, that you are working through the pain of divorce. You have experienced that maybe in your parents, or you have that in another member of your family, and you are seeing the consequences of those decisions. Friend, that does not mean that God's gift is somehow not worth pursuing. It can't still be a blessing. Any more than it means that the sweat of our face means that we should just never eat bread anymore. (laughs) The sweat of our face is going to be part of the challenge. It's going to add an element of difficulty. But friends, there's still nothing better than hot loaf of bread with butter spread on it, you know, just fresh out of the oven. That's a good thing. That's a blessing from God. And even though it takes work and labor to recognize some of those things, even though you're going to have to weed the garden, some of you are going to go home today and pick one off the stem, and there's nothing, it it doesn't compare to anything you buy at the grocery store, amen? It's something that's worth the effort There might be flawed marriages. There might be destroyed marriages. And sometimes these platforms might provide as much of a venue to put human depravity on display, it seems like, than anything. But that doesn't mean that God hasn't given us the answers for how we overcome those things. We are to live at peace, as we learned last week, among ourselves. As much as is possible, as much as lies within us, we live at peace with everyone. We find ways to resolve conflict, to let the peace of God guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And if we can't start there, Christian brother and sister, in our marriages to each other, we're not going to be doing a very good job at doing that with the rest of the world and the rest of our relationship. It has to start at home. The home life is going to be where we put these things on display. But that home life is also where we're going to see our identity most clearly playing itself out. We talked about in our adult Sunday school class that met here in the auditorium this morning about the need for churches to practice personal evangelism. And even as I reminded the people here, one of the first and most important ways that starts is with moms and dads teaching their children the truth. There's a lot of times where Christian parents put these things off to the side. They're putting in 80 hours a week between the two of them or more. They're doing all kinds of effort and, you know, we'll, we'll send them to the Christian school. We'll send them to Sunday school. We'll send them to vacation Bible school. We'll put on the veggie tales or something like that and get the kids exposed. You, if you are too busy to ever take the time to share with your children the Word of God, and to teach those truths, friend, you're too busy. Something needs to change. That example is going to be learned from you 
more than it is anybody else. By all means, partner with others. Don't see that you have to do it all exclusively. But if you are neglecting that responsibility, especially you dads, then you're rejecting a clear command of Scripture, even in the New Testament, where it says, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in how? The nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's Ephesians 6. That's something that we all take a responsibility very seriously. We're going to remind you of that here, even as we, Lord willing, are going to equip you to better know how to do that. And it's not, sometimes it's just as simple as making sure you open God's Word. You teach a verse or two. Maybe it's yeah, that we're starting Kids for Truth here later this month. And maybe your time in the Word with them is making sure that they learn the verses that week. You review them. Help them explain. Talk through them. What does this verse mean? Help them be able to repeat it back to you. Model for them. Even if it's just prayer over a meal. Model for them what it means to talk to God. This isn't something that the professional people do, the really spiritual. This is something we do. It's part of our life. It's part of the influence that shapes us. Take the time to make sure your children are here worshiping and you're leading by example. It's real easy to spin this off into other things. You know, there's other competing priorities Make sure that you, as a dad, model that priority that when Sunday's here, we're in church. It's tempting to do a lot of the other things, to, to fulfill a lot of the other hobbies and other, other competing priorities. Christians should be known for making sure that they prioritize the worship of God. Parents, moms and dads together, establishing those expectations, establishing this is what we do because we're defined by our partnership with others and we're defined together as our depend, reflecting our reliance and dependence on God. Ephesians, or going back to Genesis 3.20 rather, it says the man called his wife's name Eve. This is where, as we looked in Genesis chapter 5, God says we're naming the two of them together. That's what I call them. That's how I identify them. But it is Adam who identifies his wife as Eve. And what does he call her this? Why does he call her this? Because she was the mother of all living. And that's an interesting thing because we know it's going to come true. But where the timing is here, it doesn't really... She hasn't brought any children into the world yet. Who does she have? Well, you're not going to see that unfold until chapter 4. But he calls her Eve now because she is the mother. Why does he have that? Because he recognizes the potential in what God has promised. What does he tell the woman in verse 15? I will put enmity between you and the serpent, and the woman between your offspring, the serpent's offspring, and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. What this shows us again is that hope, that next point, uh, sub-point under this, is God's potential. What he has promised he is going to do. Adam is looking to the future He's already seen what God has done in cursing them, in bringing the consequences of their sinful choices to bear on them. And yet God has said there's a deliverer coming, and that's going to come through your descendants. That's going to come from children that this woman is going to bring into the world. And so Adam says, there is hope. There is change coming. There is salvation and deliverance coming. And though she hasn't had any children yet, he knows that God is going to hold true to what he has promised. And so you see it in chapter 4, where we'll, we'll expound on this later as we continue to work through the text. But what happens there in verse 1? Adam knew his wife Eve. She conceived and bore Cain. And what does she say? I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. 
Now, was Cain the promised deliverer? As we see the story play out, absolutely not. He was, he was anything but. But did she have that expectation? I think they did. They were working towards, they, they said, God's going to do it, and maybe this is when it's going to happen. That's not how the story plays out. But they were doing so in expectancy and in faith. They knew that God, they couldn't see how it was going to happen. Maybe they were speculating a little bit beyond what was going to happen. But they were acting in the expectation that God was going to see his promises fulfilled. And where we develop our identity and where we need to see our responsibility is God's promises to us are just as certain and just as sure, whether it's as a spouse or as a parent or the people that we're supporting in the society, in the community that we live in. God has potential for each one of us. He has given us hope and purpose and a calling to fulfill. For each one of us as believers, we are supposed to glorify God in our bodies and in our spirits. Do whatever we do, whatever our hands find to do, do it with all your might. Do it all to the glory of God. And what does that look like? For each one of us, it should look like sharing the gospel, living out a Christian life that's visible, that puts Christ on display. But it also means, it doesn't mean that you have to be constantly every five seconds, you know, coming up with a new Bible verse or wear the Christian t-shirt or put the bumper sticker on your car, so to speak. It means that you need to be living a life that consistently reflects the character of God. So that's where it comes back to how are you treating your husband and wife? How are you raising your children? What does the, that trajectory tell about the course of your life when it's measured not in minutes and hours and days, but over the weeks, the months, and the years? What does the trajectory of your life tell other people about what you believe and why you do what you do? To the glory of God is something that we need to measure precisely, but also over long periods of time. Are you committed? Are you believing? Are you faithful to the purpose and the potential that God has given to you? If we recognize that God has given us partnership, has given humanity the potential, so Adam and Eve are looking ahead to see what God is going to do and expecting him to follow through, expecting him to give them that hope, we too need to do as they did and pursue the purpose that God has given to us. And that means, first of all, that we must have faith. We pursue our purpose by demonstrating the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. And that's our next point on the outline, pursuing our purpose by displaying faith. And I'd like to invite you to turn to Hebrews chapter 11. We believe in what God has done, and belief, faith, is talked about here probably more clearly than any other passage in the, either the Old or New Testaments, giving us the definition in verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So we have hope, we have an expectation, and we live in accordance with with what we understand God is going to do. Adam, in our text in Genesis 3, is a perfect example of that. He calls someone a mother who hasn't had any children yet. But he knows that God has said this is going to happen, and he expects it's going to happen. So he gives her that name. He gives her that significance. There is a faith that is there. We also understand at the same time when we believe God, you look at all the examples that are here in Hebrews chapter 11. How do we see that these people believed? It is because of their actions. By faith, verse 4, what does Abel do? He offers God a sacrifice. He shows he believes and he follows through with consistent action. Enoch is taken up that he should not see death because he was commended as having pleased God. End of verse 5. 
By faith, Noah. What does he do? God tells him there's going to be a flood. Noah builds an ark. By faith, Abraham, verse 8, obeyed when he was called out to go to a place where he didn't know where he was going. And he saw, as the author of Hebrews says, a city that had foundations, whose builder and maker was God. A city that didn't exist yet. But he left going to that place with the expectation that God was going to see his promises through. And every example that we have here, Moses, Joseph, uh, Rahab, it's people here who hear God, they're exposed to his truth, and they act upon it. They believe, therefore their life reflects it. And friend, it's no different for us. When we believe in Jesus Christ, we should also reflect that faith through how we live. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please Him, to please God. Whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. That is, it's not just an intellectual concept. Those who seek him demonstrate it through their actions. So that's why I can say, yes, fathers, you need to be godly. You need to be believing. But one of the ways that you're going to do that is by making sure you read the Bible with your kids and bring them to church. Because that's a demonstration of your faith. I'm not just believing consciously in God that he's saved me from my sins and he's going to take me to heaven. Because, yes, I do believe those things, but if I'm a sinner and I know that Christ has saved me from my sin, he doesn't want me to keep sinning. He wants me to know his truth. He wants me to find him and to put him on display to a world, find him in his word. And so I'm going to pass those truths on. I believe this, and so it's important for me to pass this on. These are the priorities that God has set. I might not always do it consistently. There might be places I needed to, I need to grow and to change and do better, but I'm going to make it a priority because I believe. And that goes through not just parenting decisions. That goes through how you represent yourself with your personal integrity when you talk to others, why we don't lie why we tell the truth, why we're faithful to our spouses sexually, even when maybe the other partner we don't feel is putting out like they should. Because it's not a matter of you do this for me and I'll do this for you. For the godly individual, we do this because we believe this is important to God, and that's how he wants us to live. It's not a trade-off. We should love each other, but if we, whether, we love each other, whether the other person loves us or not, we love unconditionally. We love because God has told us to love. And as we look all through all these examples in Hebrews 11 and how they live by their faith, this is what the author of Hebrews makes in the next chapter, the conclusion. After all these people have demonstrated their faith, what does he say in verse 1 of chapter 12? Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Cain, or, or not Cain, Abel, <laughs> Abraham, Enoch, Moses, Abraham and Sarah, all these people, how do they show their faith? They are the ones who have fulfilled it. They have demonstrated what it means to believe and act consistency, consistently. Let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely to us. They had to put away their own poor behaviors and run with endurance the race that is set before us. That means we don't get distracted by our failures. We have to renew ourselves in faith. We have to be consistent. We have to see that there are things we still need to improve. And how do we do that? We don't look at our failures, our flaws, and disappointments. The answer is in verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. He's the one who gave us salvation, gave us something to believe in, and he's the one who is perfecting our faith. He says, yes, you have not always done everything perfectly, 
But I am doing the work in you, and I have promised to perform it and complete it until the day I return. You're a work in progress, but let's keep doing the work. Let's keep going. Let's keep growing. And that's what God has called us to do. Who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. He had his challenges. He loved everybody so much that he sacrificed himself. And he, the ones he loved, the ones he invested in, the ones he spent three years of his life pouring into and gave them all the power, where were they when he was crucified? Not there with him. They had run off. They had denied him. They had abandoned him. Jesus didn't give up. We might give up, but we don't have that example modeled in front of us. friends. And the one who has done the work for us is the one who is doing the work in us. Don't let our failures be a reason to say we shouldn't keep trying. Let your failures be a reason to look to Jesus and say, I need your help. I can't do this alone. I believe. Help my unbelief. Help me grow. Help me change. And we know that even here for Jesus, the reward is worth it. For him, he despised the shame and is now, at the end of verse 2, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He achieved victory. And through Jesus Christ, we too can see this through to completion. It is not an impossible task. A life of faith believes that the God who started this is also the God who can finish this. So have faith and then take the time to share that hope with others. Looking over to the next chapter in Hebrews, in Hebrews 13, beginning in verse 14. For here... We have no lasting city. We don't have anything that's going to endure. This is not the reason for which we live. And I think the author of Hebrews mentions that because he sees that's our primary distraction. Why wouldn't we want to come to church on Sunday? Well, because we got Vikings tickets. Or because, you know, it's a really nice day and it's been a hard weekend and the lake is calling. There's things that I've got to do. My kids are in sports and they have a game scheduled. And we think that sometimes fulfilling those reasons and purposes are more important than forming their hearts for a life of faith. And instead we sacrifice their futures for the present. I'm not saying we have to be rigidly, I'm not saying there can never be exceptions, but friends, we have to think through carefully what are those consequences when we trade off the eternal for the temporary. There's something to be said for the discipline, for the priority of repetition week after week, month after month, day after day, year after year. We love God. And so we are going to dedicate ourselves to hearing his truth, to being with his people, to make sure that these things are done because he's the most important thing in our lives. We have no lasting city here because we seek the city that is to come just like they did in those Old Testament examples that were given to us. We keep reading. So do not neglect to do good and to share with what you have. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. They don't just do him good and benefit. They have benefit for us. They grow and help us, they help us grow and change. But in the process, we encourage others to follow that example. Whether it be the children around you, whether the people watching around you to say, how does this get done? They need to see and hear your consistent example of faith. Maybe you don't even have kids anymore. Pastor, what difference does it make if I'm in church every week? Because they see you believe. They see that this is still important to you when you're in your 60s, 70s, 80s, and even 90s, like some of you are here today. It's still what matters. It shouldn't be the only thing that reflects your Christian life, but if we can't start here with some of the most basic things, 
And what's the point? The point is, we believe in Jesus. We want to magnify him together. We want to help each other grow and change to look more like him. And that's going to be accomplished here in the community, in the partnerships that he's given to us. The point I want you to remember as we close from this passage this morning is just like Adam and Eve had that expectation of God's promises being fulfilled and he had the foresight to call his wife the mother of all living, so should we also have the foresight to know that Jesus is coming back and his promise gives us purpose. That's why we do the things that we do. That's why we live how we live. Don't forget that. Make it important. Make it a priority. Thank you, Father, for giving us your hope and your truth. Thank you for giving us even practical reminders of how these things need to demonstrate themselves in our lives uh, through your word, that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, that we need to take our responsibility to train up our children seriously, that we need to love our husbands and wives as we do ourselves. We need to be selfless. We need to be giving. We need to have community priorities. And why do we need to do this? Because this is the model. This is the example that your son has set for us, who loved us even unto death. Help us, Lord, to have that same consistency of focus, consistency of purpose, and even the little things that you've called us to, so that we might know your reward and your blessing, and we might be effective at displaying Christ to a watching world. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.